headbands. This has been uh, uh, difficult for, of course, the obvious COVID restrictions, but uh, this is a good example of transferring online uh, what uh, we would have done otherwise in, in person. Now, typically these activities would entail the technical talks, site visits, which are now difficult to, to, to organize, and uh, social events, as well as the continuous, continuous professional development for um, early careers, engineers, or for people who would like to, to know more about uh, changing uh, somehow career paths or getting more uh, guidance. And also we support students of universities in, uh, say, becoming more prepared when uh, applying for positions. This is basically what we what we do, and the next slide should be more about today's or tonight's event. Uh, yes, as I said earlier, Women's in Engineering Society is Joe Douglas Harris, who is basically uh, helping behind the scenes, and the aim of this is to really promote the fundamental role and contribution of female engineers. I may wish to spend a personal uh, make a personal uh, statement about this uh, there are yet not enough people engineers in the profession i can speak for uh, chemical engineers i've been a chemical engineer for probably more than 20 years with various experiences and i have seen somehow around the world uh, the early early signs of uh, uh, an increase in presence but uh, from a personal perspective, I would really like to, to see more and more because we, as the profession, is still a dominated, male-dominated profession, yet not probably the, the one with the fewer number of uh, the female colleagues, but personal opinion, not enough yet. And so this event is something that we believe may inspire people uh, in, into approaching or even further developing their their interest and of course we have two special very special uh, guests two speakers who have uh, uh, volunteered enthusiastically to share their experience to hopefully inspire and we've got uh, we have secured uh, laura jack and alison Cooley. so laura is a charter chemical engineer she is from fasco and she's got seven years experience in process design and operations. Uh, currently, she works for Wood as a process engineer at a gas terminal in Teesside. So we have borrowed a chemical engineer from a neighboring area. Uh, uh, Alison uh, is also a chartered chemical engineer. She's from Newcastle and she works at ACOM as a process safety consultant. So, uh, and has got uh, 25 years of experience in engineering, working in process design and safety consultancy. So I believe we have uh, really uh, uh, a wealth of, of experience from, say, different backgrounds, but uh, in even crossing um, uh, areas. So I believe it will be uh, the great moment for Laura to share her story. So Laura, over to you. Thanks for the, the introduction there. Sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so like um, Paolo said, I'm a chemical engineer, um, seven years experience, and I'm from Glasgow, um, but living in Newcastle and working in Teesside. So this is just a, a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today, tonight, um, my experience so far and probably a little bit about what I might potentially do in the future as well. So um, just yeah, my university experience and placements and things like that. Um, and then my career. So I've actually been working for, for Wood for seven years. Um, when I started, there were Wood Group PSN, um, but they've kind of changed throughout the years I've been with the company. 
and there's been about five logos, which is a bit of a running joke. <laughs> um, but now they've kind of, they're now wood, um, and I've kind of moved roles within that company as well. So I'll just start with um, my master's in chemical engineering. So um, why did I pick chemical engineering is, I guess, always the first question. Um, and I guess for all the reasons you'd expect, um, I really enjoyed maths at school, um, but I'm quite a practical person and chemical engineering allows you to, to really apply maths in a practical way. And it's more about problem solving. Um, I also like chemistry as well, um, and I was interested in the sciences. Um, and after much deliberation, I chose chemical engineering. Um, one of uh, my main reason behind it was because I was so unsure, um, and I knew that with chemical engineering there would be lots of different industries I could work in, um, lots of different kinds of jobs, um, and and that has definitely been the case for my graduate year. Um, I've so many people I've known have gone into different industries in engineering, different engineering roles, um, and also who didn't bother with engineering at all and just went into sort of commercial roles and finance and, and things like that. So it really is, it does offer you quite a lot of opportunities and that's definitely what drew me into chemical engineering. So I did a, a five years um, integrated master's course at Strathclyde and I picked Strathclyde basically because um, it was an accredited course, it was in a city that I, I liked. I was from the outskirts of probably about 30 miles away, so I knew Glasgow was a good place to go. Um, and yeah, I knew they had a good engineering department and there was opportunities to do sort of placements abroad and things like that. So in 2011, I did just that and I spent a semester at the University of Alicante in 2011. And in the department, I was a biofuel researcher and um, I supported their um, team investigating the production of biofuels from different waste materials. And you can see there some of the lab equipment I was using. And um, when I say waste materials, it was um, pellets of sewage sludge from different plants in Spain. So it was really glamorous work, as you can imagine. So um, that was setting up a pilot plan and looking at trying to scale those up and seeing how much um, energy we could produce from um, from those experiments and through that it was, I mean, it was a great experience I tried to learn some Spanish and the department actually took us around looking at different um, labs and because they were going to be buying a new reactor to scale up this process so it was a really interesting experience um, and you know, it was great to finish off uni and go down the beach instead of getting soaked on the way home to the train um, from uni, in, uh, as it was in Glasgow. So there was a lot of, um, when I was at uni, there was a lot of um, sort of kind of pressure to try and get some student work and some engineering experience and um, to try and build the CV. So um, the following summer, I spent my summer um, working at the, the GlaxoSmith Klein Irvine site um, and that was a 12-week placement and I got experience of sort of applying all the things you've been learning at uni but in a sort of practical environment and it turns out it's completely different to what you learn um, and it also turns out that where you're doing all these calculations by hand the long way there's different softwares and things you can use so it was a real eye-opener and it was such a massive site as well and um, I don't know if you can see in the picture there's lots of different plant areas and there was you know all sorts of different processes and massive sort of fermentation tanks so it was it was really it was really good fun actually and um, it was interesting so I did I got experience of management of change and um, I was calculating alarm set points and, and commissioning them on the plan uh, with the support of the technical team. I did a, a bit of trend analysis and pulling process data together to try and um, justify 
alarm set points on different units, um, different engineering calculations, and um, myself and another student from Edinburgh University did a large risk assessment over the plant for, for nitrogen asphyxiation. So there was a bit of safety and sort of risk management there as well. Um, so I am. Um, So after that, um, the following year, I went back and did my master's thesis at the site again. So I kind of pulled together different projects I was working on and titled the thesis um, Optimising Material Transfer in Pharmaceutical Operations. So, um, yeah, so there was lots of different projects I was working on. Um, and I forgot to mention the plant actually makes the, the active ingredient for um, penicillin. Um, the precursor. So, one of the projects I was looking at was um, issues with flow through um, the pipework, basically of this system. And um, as part of that, I was doing root cause analysis with different members of personnel at site, operators and engineers. Um, and I also developed a, a hydraulic model of the system, looking at pressure drops and temperatures and trying to identify key areas and then process conditions which were causing these solids to form in different pipework. Um, for my second project, I was looking at fermentation broth transfer and trying to um, improve the yield basically by optimising this process. So again, I was looking at lots of process data um, you can see there in the, in the graphs below, um, just trying to make improvements and, and through that project I proposed a, an automation and an operating procedure that could be implemented and then for my third project I was um, looking at vapour transfers and sort of minimising um, the loss of containment of different vapours on site. So again that was a really um, enjoyable plant experience and I think at that point I was applying for jobs um, and looking at graduate schemes and things like that. Um, I really enjoyed working on the site, but I remember feeling very um, sort of, I wasn't very confident with my knowledge at that point. And, you know, I, I felt like all the stuff that you learn at university, um, it's all sort of very detailed, but it's not quite applied chemical engineering. Um, so to be thrown right in on a site, you're trying to sort of pull that information you've learned at uni and put it in a practical scenario. And I just felt like I would prefer to maybe get more design experience before going back onto sites um, and working. So I had more of the sort of fundamental design principles of all the equipment I was I was looking at because you know it in the the chemical engineering degree you have one year where you do you know a, a big design project but it's all very much self-taught and you're like using these principles to design a theoretical plan whereas in reality it's it's very different and then um, you don't necessarily have access to all the standards and things like that that um, you need in design so at that point I was very keen to to do some get some design experience under my belt and before moving back into operations. So, um, yeah, so I applied to lots of different uh, design. It was all, mostly in energy companies. Um, I applied to lots of different design roles and eventually got a job with, um, at the time it was Wood Group PSN on their graduate scheme. So, that was um, so. I moved up to Aberdeen at that point, and the role was um, yeah, process design in a, an engineering procurement design sort of company, um, and that was working large interdisciplinary teams, lots of different engineers, lots of different clients, um, and lots of different types of projects as well. Um, so, the benefit of that being such a sort of large engineering um, hub was that there was lots of graduates, there was lots of process engineering graduates, but there was also different engineering fields. 
So there was a lot of sort of young people in, in the office and it was a, a great sort of social side of things. Um, but also there was sort of good graduate training and um, and sort of STEM events and things like that. So it was a, it was a really good graduate scheme in that side of things. Um, the kind of things I was working on, so yeah, technical studies, um, front end engineering and detailed design projects. So some examples of these, you know, I was there for four years in total, but, um, you know, I looked at designing a gas lift um, compressor bypass system um, and the instrumentation for that um, to try and reduce um, or to save six days of lost production. Um, so that, and that was involved sort of data, data sheets and um, writing start up and shut down procedures um, and has open cell reviews and things like that. Um, I did a large release study for a, a subsea tieback. Um, again, designed all the valves for topside modifications, looked at the process safety valve sizing um, and just generally lots of design calculations and simulations, sort of pump sizing, tank sizing, Hysis modeling, um, all sorts of kind of Aspen, different softwares that you would use. Um, and again, process safety, it was also a big important part of that job. Um, you know, typically as a graduate engineer, you would always be scribing for these HAZOPs. So you'd be taking all the notes and then you would get assigned all the actions, which was a, a great, obviously a great learning experience. Um, and I guess a lot of this, the role in APC is, is a, a lot about project management um, as well. You're kind of working to time scales, you're budgeting your hours and you're booking hours, different um, project codes. So it's quite, it was quite a full on role. And um, however, I, I definitely felt after this that I was keen to move back into operations. Um, my, my colleague and I call um, the sort of EPC type roles as the data sheet factory. And, I, you know, I, I just didn't realise how how much documentation you produce in, in that kind of engineering role. Um, sort of PIDs and reports and lots of data sheets and um, lots of liaison with other teams. You know, it is, it's quite, it's busy and it's, and it's interesting. But, um, yeah, once I finished the graduate scheme, I was keen to get some get back into operations again. So a, a role came up um, down in Teesside at the, the Cats Gas Terminal. And so at that point, um, I applied for that role and, I, and, I, and that was a success. So I moved with Wood and at this time, now it was Wood PLC at this point. Um, and yeah, that was back, so back into an operations role again. So the CATS gas terminal is um, a top tier coma site and it's at the pipeline which supplies, we, we process the gas from offshore and that goes straight into the national grid and straight into your, your cooker or your boiler. <laughs> um, so you can see a very atmospheric picture of the terminal down in the bottom right there. Um, and it's a lot smaller than my, first plant experience at GlaxoSmithKline, um, but there's lots of work to do. So I, so it was a much smaller team. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's only, I'm, currently I'm the only female engineer at site, um, and everyone's been there for a very long time. So that, that's, been, that's been good fun, to be honest, everyone's really friendly. Um, so the role that I do at CATS um, is a combination of I've, I've written four things there, but the thing I kind of like about operations is that there's a lot of variation um, to what the kind of work you could be doing, because it's all based on how the plant's running that day and what what operations support is required from the process engineer. Um, but the main sort of piece of work that I do at CATS is um, manage the, I manage the operation of four um, large absorbent beds. So um, they're 115 metres cubed each and it's got an absorbent in it which removes hydrogen sulphide from the, the gas to make it safer going into the national grid. 
So managing the use of those involves sort of calculations on a monthly basis to see how much material is spent and then looking at when, based on these calculations, when um, the material needs to be changed out. And as you can imagine, a 115 metre cube vessel is massive and it involves like over a week um, long process basically of, of hoovering out all this contaminated material and, and, and filling it up again. So typically I'm doing two, two large projects like that a year. Um, other things to support the ops team um, will just be general process investigations. Um, we were having issues, um, our overhead condensers and some of our columns you can see in the picture there um, are undersized or well they're, they, they're air cooled and the max temperature of air is 20 degrees. Now this year the max air temperature was something at 36 degrees on T side, so it's getting warmer and warmer. Um, so a project that I did um, a couple of years ago was investigating um, the use of um, a, a mist in the condenser fans in order to cool the air. And I did a large technical study report um, to justify that to the client, did a cost benefit analysis and that was kind of approved and installed and we managed to continue operation over the last two really hot summers where ambient tem temperature was, you know, 12, 15 degrees higher than the 20 degree design limit. So that was a really interesting project. And for that, Woods Group actually recognised um, myself and, and my colleague who were part of the, the team to install that. Um, other other sort of operations support um, based projects were um, looking at the, the columns again and, and investigating different parameters that were causing us to go off spec and and from looking at lots and lots of process data I was able to identify some tweaks that could be made to the, the advanced control logic on the column. So I, another sort of thing I do at site is, um, is, is different, different projects. So I installed a, a glycol injection system to prevent issues with acidic glycol that we're having. Um, I am currently involved in an energy efficiency project, which is looking at all our different unit operations and investigating different things that we can do to try and reduce our electricity and CO2 emissions at site because obviously that's really important in the years going forward to um, to do that and be more efficient. And um, and in general sort of day-to-day -day running of the plan, um, I'll do, I'll look at risk um, and safety KPIs, um, I'll get involved in investigations and audits, um, and if there's, you know, if there's any leaks at site, I'll have to quantify those leaks. Um, process safety, again, looking at sort of process safety times and doing any modelling to try and confirm that all our instrumentation is in order. And the commercial side of things as well is another part that I get involved in a lot more than I would like that than I did in the design world. So. Um, this year, I assessed the, the pipeline capacity and whether or not we could accept new clients into the pipeline. And I also looked at um, you know, new entrants and I do a sort of technical evaluation of that. Um, similarly, in the commercial side of things for the absorbent vendor, um, we we look at trying to get a more cost of a cost effective price on that. And then um, and that's something I've been involved with a lot as well. Um, so overall, I'd say at CATS, there's um, a lot more variation in the day-to-day -day work. And uh, yeah, it's been really enjoyable for me to, to move down there. And um, I've got some really, really good experience. So in 2020, that led to me sort of eventually getting around to compiling all that into 
my C and C report and I applied for iChemE Chartership, which was something I'd been really wanting to do. And in the the design world, there's almost quite there was quite a lot of um pressure to get that done as soon as possible. Um, but I was really wanted to make sure that when I was applying for a chartership that I had a well-rounded experience. Um, you know, I wanted to be really confident when I went into my my interview um, that I had this sort of skills and um, experience behind me for to support the application. And and so yeah, that was something that I ticked off my list, and that was for the last sort of seven years was my big future plan. But now, um, I guess I need to think of something something new to focus on. So currently, um, I'm really interested in renewable energy. Um, I've, I was always interested in the energy in, industry and getting involved in that, but I think getting involved in the sort of net zero targets, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the engineering field in general. Um, there's lots of technologies that are being investigated, um, not only obviously at my site, but you know throughout the country. Um, there's a lot of solutions to and, and decarbonisation solutions as well. So, um, I'm, that's kind of my my career objective um, is to try and get more involved in in that. And um, I'm hoping that at the moment my my support of the energy efficiency projects in my current role will help me move um, into working in more greener energy. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's that's everything from me. So, um, I guess if, if anyone has any questions, let me know. I mean, there's lots of other things I could mention project wise, and I know I've kind of been fairly brief, but um, yeah, feel free to ask me anything. Laura, thank you very much for this. Um, uh, Fascinating story about your uh, uh, your career, but certainly to what, as you mentioned at the beginning, was um, the the driving factor. Uh, yes, a passion about science and uh, the uh, mathematics and the choice of a course that would uh, fulfil that passion. But at the same time, did you have at that time any idea? Uh, where you would have ended up? Oh, not a clue, not a clue. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think w when I picked um, chemical engineering, I had a friend who I worked with um, in, in a local hotel in, in the village that I live, and she had studied chemical engineering, and she was all—I think she was all, almost about to graduate. And so, so she told me a lot of her stories, and, and I guess she was the person who really motivated me to apply. So f I guess from her stories, and I had, I had a vague idea, but yeah, no, no idea. You know, when I see myself sitting in meetings with um, 12, 12 engineers who are all men, I, I just sometimes kind of stand back and, and sort of laugh in my head because I think, you know, I, I would never picture myself here. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, uh, Laura. I think I can. Uh, I can try to read a few, a few um, questions. Uh, just I'll go in, in a virtually random order. Uh, one of our uh, attendees is asking: Are you going to get involved at all in net zero T side? Yeah. So that's something um, that is. Something that I think that the site is is interested in, and um, that that's still obviously all in the pipeline at the moment. Um, so I think, yeah, once more of that, more information on that develops, then. But I, I think it is something that um, will be of interest, definitely. All right. Uh, I just read two questions, which I believe are related. So. I'll read the first, but please hold on to the second. So, what skills do I need to be successful in studying chemical engineer? Uh, well, actually, there's also a third. What advice would you give to students at school who do not know what they want to do? And <laughs> last would be, would you 
recommend where would you recommend doing an internship for Kemeng, which which I believe is uh, somehow a it cannot be too specific, but please. Yes. Yeah, so, um, what was the first one again? <laughs> of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the first is was what skills do I need to be successful in the chemical engineering industry? Um, skills to be successful. Um, I'd say probably. I think listening and um, and I guess for me, I always try and like go back and 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 sort of do a bit of like I, I'm the kind of type of person who will listen and and then I need to go away and take something away and think about it. That's always served me well. Um, so I guess yeah, just taking your time and 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 trying to sort of learn and be organized um, with your time as well is, is another one. Um, in terms of placements, I think when you say Paolo it is, it's just where, wherever you can get the work. And I think um, for someone at school who's trying to work out what they want to do, I mean, coming to a, listening to a talk like this will be really helpful because, um, you know, at, I guess I did have a vague idea of what the day to day was going to be like for a chemical engineer, but sometimes, you know, I do think, you know, I had no idea, I had no idea what a design office was going to be like, um, and I had no idea what the difference would be in working in sort of pharmaceuticals versus, um, you know, oil and gas. It's, it's, but okay. when you hear someone talk about their day to day, it's probably a good idea of, you know, is that the kind of thing I, I would want to do is it do I want to be spending my time doing calculations discussing engineer engineering problems in a group of people um working in a team to come up with solutions to problems that's kind of the day-to-day -day chemical engineering so and I, I guess that potentially answers that other question of what skills you need to be successful because that's your day-to-day -day. um you know problem solving skills, teamwork skills, and, and I think listening to what people have to say and, um, and getting other people's opinions, because the more ideas you bring to the table, the more the, the easier the job's going to be. Um, so, and I think I think that was all, all the questions. Yeah, <laughs> there are there are somehow. Well, I'm glad that are coming more questions are coming. For example, I'll read them through. So um yeah what advice would you give to students at school who do not know what they want to do if i may i believe that laura has clearly illustrated that uh, uh, chemical engineering is such uh, a, a varied field that uh, you will hardly know <laughs> where you will yeah. end up with but i believe that uh, i am a chemical engineer i I even myself didn't know that chemical engineering existed if before enrolling for a chemical engineering degree. So this is just how crazy, if you if you pass me the expression, and how uh, uh, rewarding a career in chemical engineering is. So let's say my point of view: if you don't know what to do, but if you're strong at uh, at math and science, if you really want to know how things work and make a better world, go for Kemeng. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or if you want to make beer, um, I've got a lot of friends who do chemical <laughs> engineering who make beer, they make whiskey. Um, I've got friends who do chemical engineering who make perfume and makeup. Um, yes. It really is. It can just be anything, can't it? Um, yeah. Indeed, there's another one. What would make me stand out from others in the chemical engineering industry? Any uh, hint on that, Laura? Um, if you're at university, I think just getting involved in different things like um, iChemE stuff. Um, yeah. Because, it, like, every, you know, 
obviously the obvious things are doing doing a placement while you're at university um, or having some sort of relevant experience but um, I guess taking it to the next sort of point you know um, I'm involved in like the iChemi Future Energy Leaders group and through that we do lots of different projects for the iChemi and that's something because I mean I'm in a similar situation I'm wanting to sort of transition my career into a different um, it's in the same industry but in a different sort of role and different sort of projects so the thing you, you just really need to know what you're wanting to do and then try and get that experience and you'll not necessarily get it through work so it's just the ICME is a good thing but volunteering for different sort of yeah volunteering is, is another thing um when I was uh, applying for my my chartered engineer status I, I had to write down all the sort of ways that I'm supporting chemical engineering and, and I, I volunteered actually to um, mark people's design projects in America. Um, I, I did that for a couple of years um, and I was almost like a project manager for the Pennsylvania State University and I was Ooh, they had these and you. Wow. And, <laughs> and, um, and asking me questions about the project and I was pretending to be the project manager so that was something I did to kind of stand out as you know supporting chemical engineers on my chartership report so it's just doing extracurricular things like that I'd say um, are really helpful. Oh that's great Laura one last question before um, thanking you again so um, I'm reading you mentioned that you were a bit undecided or unsure of all the options what do you wish you knew about engineering then and do you think you might have actually chosen a different engineering? A different engineering, um, potentially. Well, so because I'm quite interested in renewables, there isn't necessarily a direct renewable degree that you can do. Um, there's only like a postgraduate. Mm -hmm. um, mechanical engineers seem to have an easier time to jump between disciplines, but. I, I really, I, you know, I really wasn't that interested in mechanical engineering, and I'm, I'm not now. So I definitely <laughs> don't think there's an, an, an instrumentation in, in electrical engineering. Again, is just, you know, I think, I, I think I wouldn't have chosen a different type of engineering, but perhaps I would have gotten into a different industry. So yeah. my main kind of, I, I want to go into design and, and I thought going for an energy company would be um you know would give me a lot of opportunity but it's quite hard to to move around between disciplines. Yeah. Um, so I'd say I wish I'd known that when I was choosing my graduate roles um, yeah. and really thought about what industry I wanted to go into right then and there. So I would say whatever your engineering degree, when you're applying for um graduate jobs like really think about the industry and, and where you want your career to go um, and I guess because because I, I think as much as people say oh you can jump from industry to industry it is difficult um, because you'll apply for a job you'll be trying to apply for a job and they, you know every company wants experience specifically to that to that role and yeah. um, so that would I, I'd say not necessarily, yeah, not necessarily the type of engineering, but certainly I would have maybe gone back and thought more about what industry I wanted to end up in and, and ways to get there. But the other thing is when you're graduating after a five year degree and you know you're in your overdraft and you're just wanting a job, there's there's also that pressure as well. You know, you just kind of <laughs> you're just applying for jobs and thinking, please, please let me get one <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah, Laura, uh, it's, it's been, of course, a really a fascinating uh, journey uh, of yours. And um, I believe that our guests have asked uh, some tricky questions because I can relate to those questions myself if I look back at when, at when I started. Uh, just really before uh, handing over to, to Alison, uh, 
I may take the opportunity to answer the one question, which is, are there many travel opportunities in this industry? You worked in two different places, you, you traveled abroad. Um, if I say, can share my experience that my second job brought me into um, 54 countries and four continents. So when this COVID thing will be over, I believe, as I said, chemical engineering is so diverse and it's not restricted to say large corporations, but you have, in particular in the Northeast, you have a myriad of uh, medium and small enterprises that are capable to, to work in uh, global markets. So that's absolutely, the sky's the limit. So that should have answered that question. Um, and I personally thank would like to thank Laura for this uh, great, great uh, uh, story of yours. And uh, yes, let's uh, welcome now Alison. And uh, it, over to you, Alison. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted to say thank you, firstly, for, for joining the webinar this evening. And it's, it really is my pleasure to, to talk to you. Let me just see if I can get my first slide up. <laughs> there we are. I must admit, when I was asked um, to speak this evening about my career in engineering, I thought they've maybe picked the wrong person because my career has been pretty unremarkable. And, and listening to, to Laura's career tonight, you know, it's, it's a really fantastic early start to a career. and. Uh, I feel very, very humble in comparison, um, but but I have worked continuously now in engineering for, for 25 years, um, so I must be doing something right, and um, and it has taken me to some some interesting places and um, met some fascinating people, and although it has been hard work, it, it's been really fulfilling and an intellectually challenging career. Um, so anyway, my hope tonight is, is just my little presentation can be can be of some use just as an insight into your, to your future career and maybe help inform any career decisions that you might make. So I'll start with a little bit about me and my background and, and why I chose chemical engineering. Talk a little bit about my time at university, but it's, it's so long ago now, it's, um, it's getting a little bit misty in time there. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my, my early career and, um, and my sort of the start of my working life and from my first job through to, to what I do now and it really has changed quite a bit. It's, uh, as, as Laura's just been saying, sort of finding your first job can be a little bit tricky and hard and particularly when you've got no relevant experience and, um, and especially for, for me, I was, I was quite an average student so uh, companies weren't exactly falling over themselves to, to hire me. But I did eventually find my first position and I got set on my way to my career. But that first step really is the hardest. <laughs> I won't explain a bit what process safety is in a bit of detail, because um, it isn't the same as, as health and safety that, that we all really know. And uh, how doing the degree in chemical engineering is, is an excellent foundation to, uh, to, to then becoming more specialised in, in process safety. If you're thinking about taking forward chemical engineering as a career, um, I've got a slide. I'll share some thoughts on, on what the sort of personal and professional attributes I think are, are useful um, in, in, to work in this area. And uh, I'll see a few questions at the end if anyone has any. So I'm from Blakelow in the west end of, of Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with the area, it's it's a relatively deprived part of Newcastle. I mean, my dad was was a van driver, and my mum worked in, in a kitchen. There were no engineers in my family, and and no one had even gone to university. Um, I have to say, my my uh, school years, I managed to find an old an old photo of the school there. Um, it was a real mixed experience for me. Reedwood wasn't exactly known for academic achievement, uh, but the teaching staff were really, really good. And 
although there were a lot of challenges there with the catchment area being being relatively deprived area, um, you know the, the teachers were very committed and obviously they, um, wanted us to, to do you know, the best that we could. Funny enough, Reedwood is, is no longer there now. It's, um, it was demolished after a fire and it's, it's now a housing estate. At school, my best subjects were chemistry and physics. Um, I enjoyed other subjects and, uh, and I always struggled with maths, funnily enough. Um, I had to work really, really hard at that. The careers advice when I was at school really wasn't that great. Um, we were given a form to fill in and, and if you were a girl, it was basically a choice between nursing or hairdressing, which are those perfectly good careers. Um, the, the teachers didn't really think that most of the students there would go on to have professional careers. So it was a little bit, a little bit different. <laughs> so as I said, I didn't really excel in any one subject, but, but I did enjoy chemistry and, that, and I thought that could be my career. Um, from being quite young, I had a dream of, of being a doctor, but it, it, it quickly became clear that I wouldn't get the, the really exceptional grades that, that you need to, to, to go to medical school. So by the time it came to, to choosing um, career placements, so about 16 years old, my, uh, my school tutor put me in the, uh, the RVI medical school in the laboratories, which was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Um, it, it did involve some, some interesting work, sort of carrying samples of, of gastric fluid up from the wards and going into the pathology lab and things like that. Um, but it was, it was fascinating and, and I, I really enjoyed it. But while I was there, my work experience supervisor sort of sat me down and said, you know, this is, this is all very good, but you know, if you work in laboratories, you will always be skinned. <laughs> You'll never have any money. You want to be an engineer instead. So um, I thought I probably should look into that really and, uh, and nobody sort of wants to set out in, in their career thinking that I was going to be skint, no fun at all. So, so when I went back to school, um, I spoke to my chemistry teacher and he got me some, um, some literature, some information from the ICME. Um, so the, the question that was raised earlier, you know, if, if you are interested, there is a lot of material on the ICME website and uh, you know, we, we just had little little flyers and things in those days, but um, but they do produce some some good stuff to give you some some insight into the uh, into the subject. So, Harry, what university? Yeah, I, I didn't do a huge amount of research into what university that that I wanted to study came in. Jat, um, we had a big a big book, and we just sort of flicked through it and saw what was good and, and what we were interested in and uh, and then went for it. So a few courses did stand out for me. Um, I like the look of Manchester, Aston and Harriet Watt. Um, but I'm really, really pleased that I sort of scraped through the grades and, and got into Harriet Watt because it's it's a great university to go to. Um, it's, it's about 10 miles outside of Edinburgh, um, about half an hour on the bus from town. I always lived in town because uh, uh, it's um, a bit more, bit more fun. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the, the chemical engineering class there we um, were quite small. There was only about thirty of us in the class, and, and five were five were girls. Um, but during the first few years of university, a lot of classes were shared with with the other engineering disciplines. Uh, so mechanical, civil, electrical, we all did shared maths classes and that sort of thing. Their male to female ratio was a lot worse, so um, so you did kind of stand out a bit more. I have to admit, though, coming from that working class background into to university, I felt like a fish out of water for quite some time, and uh, very self conscious. I found it quite difficult to put my hands up in tutorials and ask questions because I was very conscious of my accent and things like that, you know. Um, but I did grow in confidence as, as the years went past and you sort of settle in and, uh, and I think what really helped me was, was how close the class was because it was relatively small, you, you knew each other really well and, and it was very supportive, particularly in the final years when, when you do collaborate on those big design projects and you're together 
in a little room for, for, for days and days on end, you do become extremely close. I mean, when, when we finished our final exams, there was, uh, there was about 11 of us all went through to the airport and, and, and went to Magaluf for a week just to, just to recover. <laughs> but I absolutely loved it. It is one of the best decisions I, I've ever made to, uh, to go to university. And the friends I made there, you know, I still keep in touch with now, 20, pardon me, 25 years later. So some of the elective modules that, that we were able to take at uni, um, I, I chose the energy resources modules and just interesting, similarly to Laura, really um, interested in renewable energy and, uh, and, and certainly that influenced my choice of career. So again, similarly to, uh, to Laura, my first role was up in Aberdeen. I think I, I had to send away over 10, 15, something like that, job applications and interviews before I finally got an offer um, from, from a company called Acker in Aberdeen. There's a lovely picture of Union Street up there. Um, so whilst, uh, whilst I was at Acker, one of my first jobs was being sent up to uh, the Sumbo Oil Terminal in Shetland, which is the, the picture at the bottom there. And uh, I was part of the, the pipeline management team on the site. For, I was there for about a year and the, the platform, sorry, the, um, the pipeline was kind of the link between the offshore platform and the terminal. So it's, it's sort of, you were coordinating that link and, and managing the, the, you know, the, the link between the storage capacity and processing operations at the terminal and then communicating that to offshore. So, so everything was in balance. Um, and the, uh, the experience was great. I, I didn't get, really very much um, site experience at university. I mean, it was tough, it was tough times. And, and because I wasn't sort of one of the exceptional students in the year, I didn't get to do work placements or, or any kind of sponsorship. So, so that was really my first experience of being on a site. I mean, what a site it was at the, the end of the country, you know, um, very beautiful place, uh, really enjoyed it there. And it was, it, it was excellent experience and, uh, you know, it's it just makes design work and, and chemical engineering so much easier when you've had that experience of being on site and you can visualize what the equipment looks like and, uh, and, and how it works. So, so it was absolutely invaluable. One of the, the major projects I was involved with early on in my career was, uh, was the middle picture there. It's, um, the Banff FPSO floating production storage and offloading platform. So, so as one of the, the junior chemical engineers on that project, I mean, my, my job was to design a lot of the utility systems. So I think this is common for, for the, sort of the junior engineers on the team because they're, sort of, they're relatively more straightforward systems, uh, less hazardous systems to, uh, to design. Great experience to be in that kind of project environment, and you know, as, as Laura says, it's it's a wonderful atmosphere and very interactive and collaborative, and, uh, and I really did enjoy that. And the good thing about being the process chemical engineer on jobs like that is, is you're the kind of the hub of the whole project. Everything revolves around process, so it's only when you know they've done their job at sizing the. Uh, the main items of process equipment, like the oil and gas separators and the, the gas compressors, then the mechanical engineers can do their work and uh, you know, actually specify the vessels themselves. And then the, the control engineers can do their piece and the structural engineers know the size of the equipment so, so they can you know, make sure the loading is, is correct. So it's a uh, it, it, it's great feeling you know, it's part of this, this, the center of, of everything, you know. Working on that project was my first introduction to process safety, um, attending HAZOPs and, uh, and other risk assessments like that. You know, I quite enjoyed it, but 1999, there was a, quite a substantial downturn in the oil and gas industry and uh, the jobs were looking really, really quite insecure, to be honest, quite similar to the way we are now with them um, with the downturn in the economy with with the pandemic it's it's quite a quite a tough time so uh, so i sent off my cv and um, and just saw what come back really i was 
really lucky to get a phone call from a company called at the time ICI UTech down in Teesside. Lastly, they became ABB. I absolutely jumped at the chance to, to come back to the Northeast. I had missed it. I'd been away for about, oh, about eight years. So, um, so yeah, so while at ABB, they supported me through the chartership process. Um, and it's, as Laura mentioned, it's, it, it, it's quite a lot of work pulling together your, your, your experience and, um, and demonstrating your, your competence in, in a number of different areas to, to demonstrate that, that you've got the, the necessary uh, professionalism and experience to be chartered. So while I was at ABB, most of the projects that, that we were involved in, um, sort of small consultancy and, and design work, it was really to, to, to serve the local industry down there at Wilton and Billingham, North Tees and, and other sites in the area. So it is typically small projects, very established manufacturing sites and producing the chemicals that, that we use for plastics and cleaning products, that kind of thing. I just want to say at, at this point that um, although it sounds like my career has always been oil, gas and chemicals, that the environment, environment protection and safety just, just run all the way through it hand in hand. It's, it's so very important. Um, and a lot of the projects that we do get involved in are specifically about safety and environmental protection at that time. Um, and I, I do think one of the, the good things about, about chemical engineering is that you're in a position of influence to, to be able to improve environmental performance for these sites. Um, you know, unfortunately, until we we have the renewables and, and the alternative materials, um, we, we're going to have to focus on just making these products as, as environmentally friendly as possible, really. So I just want to talk about one, one notable project I was involved in at this time, which is the, the, the bottom picture that you can see that that redundant plant. Um, this was an old, an orphan's plant um, that was redundant. The plant stopped producing um, sometime in, in the mid 1980s. The owners of the site, they thought that it would just be a temporary shutdown while they got some extra funding from the government, but it never happened and, uh, and the plant was never restarted. So it was almost 20 years later, um, the owners of the site said, you know, this is no good going to have to safely demolish the site. So see, before it, it's dismantled, they needed a, a really comprehensive plan to be able to do this safely, um, to manage the hazards involved with this. Uh, and for example, some of the, some of the tanks in the, the columns um, that you can see there could contain chemicals um, that could catch fire or explode even, pardon me, if, if exposed to the air. I think from memory it was um, like a butadiene polymer um, that, that could be present. So, so in addition to, to the, the residual chemicals, there was also live services and uh, an electrical cable still live running through all over the site. So we carried out a project to, um, to assess the risks, identify what the hazardous materials were and uh, and try and map the live services just, just by observation and producing our own drawings. There were very few drawings and, and records left of the site. They'd just all been abandoned. So that was, that was quite an interesting one and probably unique in that I'll never do anything quite like that again. Um, and thankfully, that the, the site was safely demolished a few years ago now. The top photo that you can see there is, is the Ensis biodiesel plant that's also at Wilton and um, the, the company I currently work for, Ecom, have, have worked with that site before. But I just wanted to show that as, as being a really good example of the kind of current um, places where chemical engineers could work. And it's brilliant because it produces the bio, uh, bioethanol from green and renewable energy, but also manufactures um, carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And where would we be without carbon dioxide and, and our fizzy drinks? <laughs> so, it takes me to almost the present day and, uh, and, and what I do at the moment. So, 
So I left DBB and I had a few other jobs. I worked at Enec, which is now Wood in, in Darlington, and also Fabricom in Newcastle for a few years. And then I, I joined Ecom in, um, in 2015. It's, it's a really big company in America. Um, it's based in Los Angeles, and, but we've got several thousand people in, in the UK, mainly focused on, on sort of infrastructure pro projects, um, transportation, uh, new buildings, that sort of thing. Got quite a small team in, in process safety, but, but we get a lot involved in a lot of small, different, interesting type of projects. So into my little my new little home office now, working from home. Um, Acom's policy has, has always been um, that you know you can work anywhere you want. You've got a phone, you've got a laptop. If you want to work in the office, that's that's fine. If you want to work from Costa Coffee, that that's fine as well. Um, but obviously, you know, come uh, come March this year, that was the reality for us all. And starting to get more used to it, um, but I do miss the interaction with other people, and, and I miss getting out on site and meeting customers and that sort of thing, and live your life in a permanent state of anxiety about your internet connection as well. Um, but the really good thing about, about what I do currently is, is having such a wide range of clients. I'm, I'm currently working for chemicals, pharmaceuticals, power generation, defence, manufacturing. I've got, I've got the list here and it's it's, it's pretty extensive. So it covers everything, um, which is great. We provide support to, to the major inf infrastructure projects that, that ACOM carry out. Um, I get involved in, in helping out with environmental impact assessments. And uh, these documents, they, um, they can involve you know, many, many people, teams of, sort of 20, 30 people, all specialists in, in different areas, acoustics, air quality, ecology, um, and that sort of thing. So, so we all collaborate to produce these documents for, for new projects, such as the, um, the Net Zero Teesside project that, that, that um, one, of our, one of our guests mentioned earlier. Um, so, so we would get involved with producing the planning applications and the, uh, and the EIEs for, for projects such as that. So my involvement in that would be to include an assessment of, of the potential major accidents and disasters associated with that type of development. So we apply um, a, a structured hazard assessment um, methodology to, to do this work. Um, and that, that's then taken forward and used by the project to, to develop their means of preventing these accidents. And for instance, um, sort of look at flooding and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So we, we, we'd have the, the, um, the required sort of flood defences and that kind of thing. I would say that the majority of the work I do is, is just driven by safety compliance, um, I mean, particularly sort of preventing fires and explosions. So that, that kind of area that I'm especially interested in. Um, and these can be sort of small projects, say typically two or three months, um, going to sites, doing a survey, coming back, writing a report. I have to manage all my own work myself. So I, Unfortunately, I have to do all the commercial and, and the business development, which means sort of writing proposals and cost estimates, which can be really time consuming. And you have to understand all the terms and conditions and, and the legal um, part of contracts to, 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 to issue our clients with, with these proposals and, and work with them. And obviously being, um, you know, sort of being in a small team, we're, we're constantly involved in checking and approving other people's work. So, so we um, have a very uh, strict sort of quality control procedure where all our calculations, all our reports, they're sort of subjected to a very fine, fine detail check before anything goes off to, to clients. As I mentioned before, Ecom only have a, a small process safety um, group in the UK, but it's much larger worldwide. Um, we've got a lot of specialists, so particularly in, in the States, we've been an American company, and we share our knowledge and experience through our ACOM technical practice group, which is great. We meet about once a month, and we have a webinar like this on, on a selected topic, which could be anything like risk assessment. Or, or The last one that we did was on virtual auditing. So someone needed to, to carry out an audit on site during lockdown. Um, 
they couldn't delay that audit. It was because it was an American company, they have to, by law, undertake these audits on, on a, a defined time scale. So it couldn't be delayed. So, so they had to develop a way of doing that remotely, which was very interesting how they managed to achieve that. And that, that's probably one of my most favorite parts of, of my current role. And, and I really enjoy hearing how the guys over in the States work because their approach to process safety is really different to, to us in the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just fascinating. There's so much that we can learn from each other. So just to say um, how important process safety is, um, to mention that it's very different to, you know, just general health and safety because everybody's heard of that, you know, and uh, we're all wearing our, our PPE, our face masks now. And health and safety is specifically focused on protecting people from harm and ill health and, and having accidents like slips, trips and falls. And it's it's not a new thing, as you can see, we've had it for over 200 years now, um, since the first legislation, which was to I think, limit the time that children could spend at work. And it's, uh, it's come along a lot since then. So process safety is it, it's a specific branch of engineering focused on preventing the major accidents such as fire, fires and explosions. And I've, I've shown that photo there from that um, unfortunate explosion in Beirut recently that, that you'll all remember from the news. And over 200 people died. And when the storage silo containing ammonium nitrate exploded. In the UK, we have statutory regulations, which the laws directly concerning how materials such as ammonium nitrate can be stored and, and can be made. And uh, you could ask the question, so, well, well, why do we need to have this material when it can be so hazardous? You know, can we not have an alternative? But um, unfortunately, it's it's an excellent fertilizer and we've got a lot of people to feed on the planet. So, so un until we can have alternatives, we, we need to safely use this substance and, and manage the risks. And, and that's where the process safety specialist comes in. Um, so we set limits on, on how much can be made and stored. And uh, there's a, a couple of sites in the UK that, that manufacture this substance. And there's a few on Teesside and I think over in, in Cheshire. So they must demonstrate to the authorities, the health and safety executive, the environment agency, that, that what they are doing is safe and they've reduced their risks on site to as low as they possibly can. And the role of the process safety specialist is, is to help these companies to, to design and operate their safety systems and then and, say, manage the risk during their operations. So what does the future hold for, for me? Well, I um, hope to stay employed mostly. <laughs> You know, the next few years are going to be really, really challenging for us all um, as we come out of the, the, the current pandemic and the negative economic impact that's had on us. Um, it, it's such a worrying time and, um, you know, I, I really feel for the students at the moment. You know, it's, um, it's, it must be very, very difficult trying to study and with all of this going on, not easy. But, um, you know, there's, although that, that situation is ongoing, there is still a lot of good news. And, uh, you know, we've got lots of good projects being developed, particularly on Teesside, which is fantastic. We've got a new biomass power station that's, I think, almost um, almost approaching the end of the construction phase down in Teesside. And uh, in, this, in Net Zero Teesside, which is a very viable carbon capture and storage project, which would be brilliant. And I've just seen recently we have um, a new uh, a new site in, in Hartlepool, which will be the, the marshalling base for the, um, the Dogger Bank offshore wind project. All really, really exciting new projects. We do have a few graduates at, at ACOM, although we're a sort of small team, so I'm, I'm hoping to, to work with them and, and help them sort of develop their, their experience. So we don't have as many um, opportunities to do training courses at, at work anymore. We can't sort of 
send graduates away for a couple of weeks you know we, we've got to kind of keep them in, engaged and, and chargeable unfortunately so um so the, the it makes it even more important that their work experiences is valuable to them the home learning <laughs> yes yeah, so um trying to keep engaged with your customers and, and your colleagues and and not become isolated will be a real challenge i think and consultancy can be quite um quite isolating because you do work alone a lot um so yeah we're all getting used to to the the teams and zoom calls and that kind of thing now very important to keep learning and um continuous professional development is is an absolute fundamental requirement you'll never stop throughout your career and you'll never stop finding opportunities to keep improving um and I, I say I, I don't get opportunities to go on training courses but I seek out um interesting journal articles and pleasing guidance documents and you're doing all that we can just to stay um, informed and, and to be able to to give our customers the best advice that we can it, it's a really satisfying part of my job when a client will call you up and ask you for, for help you know feel very valued um which is great so i'm quickly go through uh, what i think makes a good engineer obviously technical knowledge and experience is, is vitally important um obviously trying to avoid the situation that you can see there in, in the, the photograph um, that's that's what we all aim for um, the personal attributes are extremely important but i just want to say that that they can be learned um communication skills they, they absolutely can be learned um i think as long as you have an inquiring mind and you ask lots of questions um a lot of these these sort of skills just can be developed as, as you progress through your career. And certainly that the best engineers and consultants I've worked with, they're all very clever, but they have those personal attributes that set them apart. Um, very good, um, clear, clearly spoken and excellent technical writing. And just being so articulate and being able to explain very complex concepts quite simply and concisely. I, I can struggle with this. I have a tendency to waffle, so I, I try and learn as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But professionalism and integrity are extremely important as well. And you know, nobody's going to employ someone again if, if they've arrived late for a meeting, if they're not prepared. The work looks untidy and sloppy, so it's absolutely vital. High standards in everything that you do, um, you know. Being customer focused, you have to um, be able to, to be a good listener, to build a rapport with your clients, to, to get them to trust you. And you know, it is, it's a bit of a cliche to say that you have to have a passion for what you do, but but you can tell when someone has it and when somebody doesn't, and they're kind of going through the motions. So, but just say that you know, most process safety specialists don't don't really start out doing that. They're, Mostly like, like me come from um, chemical engineering and then you sort of gradually go into it over time. I think you can do um, postgraduate degree courses, so masters in, in safety engineering. Um, yeah, Sheffield's do a very good one. But it can also be learned. Be learned. Mm -hmm. So instrumentation, you mentioned before that, that a lot of instrument engineers become safety specialists. Um, it's, it's obviously very important because safety systems on process plants are computer controlled and very complex monitoring so temperature pressure flow rate and and it's vital that that these systems work to prevent accidents such as that, that picture of, of the Bunsfield uh, fire and explosion in 2005 and one of the reasons behind that that incident was a failure of instrumentation the tank of petrol which was being filled the, the the level gauges malfunctioned so the operators didn't realize that the tank was full and it overflowed and there was a, a pump which was started which supplied the energy for for the ignition so I, thankfully um, i thought that was the the largest explosion um in the uk since the second world war nobody was injured thankfully So there were why choose engineering, um, the opportunity to keep the country functioning. Um, 
see the vital work that that law is, is keeping our our heating the gas supply for our heating is, is so important um now i've been lucky enough to, to work on some some good projects um that that would help keep our energy supply and, and keeping the lights on and you know, that, that's really satisfying just to, to feel like you're doing something useful um, i have a friend who works at a, a pharmaceutical site down in teesside and they're potentially going to be making a vaccine for the coronavirus and i'm, I'm just so proud of them um, choosing engineering you can you can help really make such a big difference and keep people safe and also protect the environment um, reducing emissions from, from power stations things like that and you guys may be too young to remember acid rain um, but this was caused by by sulfur dioxide emissions from power stations and it was it was like a big topic back in the 80s and the reason that nobody talks about it now is because we have limits on on the emission levels and we have abatement systems that, that prevent this material from being released and uh, rained out and um, caused uh, damage to vegetation and trees that sort of thing so you know you can have such a positive impact it's great to, to meet some interesting people and visit some quite interesting places too I was lucky enough to, to work for a while in Norway and Finland and uh, I loved it. It's, it's definitely my kind of place, but a little bit expensive for, for the, the beer. It's about 10 pounds a pint there. I have to say that, you know, every day is different um, and there's always something new to learn. So that, that's almost all I've got for you. And, and, and I hope that you found it at least sort of a bit informative and, uh, and useful and uh, just to stress that it's it's really hard it is really hard work i mean every career is but you know i've, I've done shop work and bar work and, uh, and and that's hard but this is hard in a different way <laughs> um, and i did say at the start of this presentation that that my career had been pretty unremarkable and, and i do I do stand by that but I, I just wanted to leave you with some um some of the careers of my classmates at Terriot Watt, and, and I do think that they have had remarkable careers. Um, my friend Tanya, who she um, has worked all over the world for BP since graduating and, and currently is working for them in Singapore. Um, Paul, who was from Lowfell in Gateshead, and he's now managing a, a, a refinery in Southern California. And, and Owen, who pretty much has taken my ideal job by uh, going to work at the Talisker Distillery on Sky. So I think that's me at the end of my presentation. So, so again, thank you for, for joining us this evening and, uh, and thanks for listening and please feel free to ask me anything. Alison, thank you very much. Uh, I might be speaking on behalf of, of everyone who has attended and who's listened to uh, your, your stories also fascinating. And uh, I personally believe that you have done an incredible amount of, of work and starting with um, uh, the the right uh, um, uh, uh, suggestions from high school trying to understand what you really would have loved to do and uh, the diversity of work that you've done is really really speaks for itself and uh, in the very few minutes now left uh, for this webinar I would like to ask you somehow a question um how did you feel when you realized that you had to somehow change your career in order to of course uh, secure uh, let's say either a position or somehow expand your knowledge did you feel that you had uh, everything you needed to do that oh oh no um to be honest um it's it's often quite quite a leap of faith really um i think the, the one thing that's that, that's sort of been my, my kind of driving force throughout my career from from being at school through university you know it's, it's been really single-minded thinking well um what, what do i want and, and how am i going to make it happen for myself so so from school it was well what do i do to, to take 
subjects that I'm, I'm good at and I'm interested at and, and how do I make that into a career for myself um, and then going into my first job as I say I enjoyed the, the energy engineering part of uh, my degree course and I thought yeah that, that seems like the logical step um, but it, I think that that was the, the, the big change for me from going from the oil and gas industry down to into Teesside which was onshore which was chemicals based and and, and to be honest, it, it was a real leap of faith. I, I didn't know if I'd be any good at it. I didn't know if um, <laughs> it's, if it was going to be for me. And um, it was quite a change going from those big design projects to, to doing sort of small, small studies where you, you'd even just design a relief valve. You know, it's very, very small work. Yeah. So, so I just had to just just get on with it, thinking, well, you know, this is a door opening. I'm, I want to take this opportunity to to see what see what is on the other side of this door and um, and, and just see what life has to offer for me. And I, I think you have to do that sometimes. I think it's, 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 it's a yeah. of faith. And, and having that confidence that, that you can do it. You know, if, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly, certainly I agree. Um, Alison, I've got a, a few questions for you. Let's say um, I'll go with this one probably. Uh, I am curious about the day-to-day -day experience of a chemical engineer in a job. Can it get repetitive and or boring? I believe the answer is obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes it, it can be, um, but I, I do say that every day is not the same. Um, sometimes you, you can get stuck on a on a project that, that's, that's difficult yeah. and it's not particularly exciting for you but but there's, there's always positives to, to find in that you know um if it's i've, I've never been complete i have to say i've never been really bored i've i felt often overwhelmed with with how much work i've got to do uh, I, I feel like quite often to be honest um try and keep as busy as i can but um but no that's uh not something that I, that I haven't found interesting because that there's something interesting to find in, in almost everything I do. I see it's it, it's constantly changing. The type of work that that we do changes so often. I, I mean, today I can be speaking to um, to a site that I'm working with in Vienna, um, and, yeah. and that sounds quite quite exciting. But uh, but that, that just feels almost day to day for me now. Um, so it's so no, it's um, I, have, I have to honestly say that I've, I've never felt bored. Other than the times where I've not had enough work to do, if um, you know our, our clients haven't haven't been able to, to get us going on a project, and, and I'm sort of sitting with with sort of no project work to do, in which case you have to have that motivation and drive to say, well, I'm going to pick up a book or I'm going to pick up a you know a journal and, and just educate myself or do something just to just to sort of manage those times. Hopefully that was okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, indeed. I I do, I do personally feel the 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 very same. Uh, I've worked in various places, and uh, actually, you might need some time of uh, repetitiveness uh, to really get into the nitty gritty of, of of things. And you you will learn by doing things. Then, of course, yeah, challenges mm -hmm. will always find a way to. <laughs> to tease you. I've got another question. I believe this is even more uh, uh, accurate uh, or uh, relevant for today. Do you feel being a woman in engineering has been an asset or an hindrance or neither? And do you see more women in engineering at this stage of your career than when you started? Um, I do actually. Yeah, I, I work with quite a, quite a lot of um, female engineers and also scientists um, the, the team when, when I mentioned uh, working on a few um, environmental impact assessments for, for developments we work with uh, with architects archaeologists ecologists and there's, there's a lot of women um, scientists and engineers are are collaborating on that so 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 where I am now there's there's, there's a lot more women than um, my first role when I was up in, in Aberdeen and uh, and working on, on the design project. Um, but I've, I've never felt that being a being a woman is a hindrance at all. I've never felt disadvantaged. Um, we have had some times where a client has said, you know, you, you need to go for a meeting um, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. 
um, down at Newport in Wales. And you, know, <laughs> you, know, you just have to organise your, your life and just get on with that. Um, and I know that can be difficult if, if you have a family and other responsibilities. Um, but that's the that's same for, for men and women, you know, we, we, we have to respond to what our customers ask and and, and then just just do it, you know. Um, but I've never felt that it, it was a benefit at all or or um or help me out. It, it it does seem seem strange saying that, but I, but but I, I don't think that my career and, and some of my sort of contemporaries from from Harriet what that the guys been substantially different in in a lot of ways like that. Um they don't feel sort of a benefit from being male. Um right. women. I think uh, I don't know if, if Laura has a has an opinion as well, but I find Aberdeen is, is quite um quite egalitarian, you know, you sort of you're all one team, um, you've got socialising together and that breaks down barriers and uh, yep. and people sort of see you as a person like, like that. So that's a good thing about engineering. You have those opportunities to connect with people and to, to get them to see you as you know as just as a person. Um, so yes, it's 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 great that that I hope more women do come into engineering and it's and it's a great career. Um, it's been very good to me. And I would absolutely <laughs> recommend it. Um, it. You know, it's uh, I, I have I have no regrets in doing this. And and after twenty five years, there's there's nothing really else I could kind of see myself doing. Um, so so hopefully yeah. that's, that's encouraging someone. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, uh, Alison. I mean, I don't think that there's time for more questions. But uh, yes, I, I would like to really. Uh, thank you all. I would like to thank uh, Laura and Alison for their contribution and Joe, of course, for making this possible. Joe, if you have really 30 seconds to present the next event, I'll uh, then leave it to you. And I will. I would like to thank all the, the people who have uh, shared their time with us and uh, looking forward to see you at the ICME events as soon as they happen again. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Yeah, thanks very much. So we've got the um, the next event is going to be on the 12th of November, the same time, half seven till nine o'clock, and um, part of the same series, this time hosted by the Women's Engineering Society. Um, and we're going to have a bit of um, history about female engineers who've sort of paved the way for where we are today, followed by a panel discussion where some local female engineers are going to talk about the future of engineering. So I hope everybody will join us for that and thank you for joining us today. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, good night.